All right, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm gonna give it just one or two minutes for folks to log on and then we'll jump into the session, but we'll probably start about one, one or two after uh, one o'clock here, but welcome again and thanks, thanks for joining us. All right, let's get started. Um, so my name is Matt Cornwell. I am the Associate Director of Student Services for the Saunders College of Business at RIT. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our session today. We're really excited to have a, a great group and panel here today to discuss leading into the future. Just a couple logistical items before I turn it over to Dr. Jerry Shea. Um, you'll see in the bottom of your Zoom screen here, um, if you do have questions throughout the session, please, please feel free to put those in the Q&A function here. Um, and we'll certainly get to those as we work through things. There is also captioning, um, just simply hit show captions there and there'll be an automated feed that you can follow through from a captioning sense. And I also just wanna mention that the session is hosted and brought to you by two of our graduate programs in the Saunders College of Business, our MS program in Organizational Leadership and Innovation, which is a fully online program, and also our MS program in Hospitality Business Management, which, which is also a fully online option. Um, but again, if you have any questions as we go through things, feel free to ask. Um, but at this point, I'll turn it over to Dr. Jerry Shea, who's the Grad Program Director for Hospitality. Thank you, Matt. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jerry Shea. I am the graduate director of RIT's Master in Hospitality Business Management Program. My co-panelist is Dr. Mala Hirudaya Rush. Dr. Mala is the graduate program director of the MS in Organizational Leadership and Innovation. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest, Rob Lober, who is the CEO and founder of XLO Global. From 2014 to 2020, Rob was the Senior Vice President and Global Chief Learning Officer of McDonald's Corporation. Rob has more than 30 years of experience in organizational learning and talent development. And most of all, Rob is an RIT alumnus. Rob, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Hey, thanks for having me. Really glad to be here. And we would like to actually begin, you know, with your career story. So could you tell us what experiences, uh, opportunities brought you to where you are today? <laughs> yeah, um, actually a, a lot of luck and a lot of good timing, I think, and a little bit of skill, I'm sure, along the way. Um, you know, I um, I can talk about sort of uh, my post, my pre-post RIT. So I ended up at RIT in a master's program um, in human resources development, actually, in the in the 1990s, it was, um, mostly because I wanted to pursue, uh, I had gotten exposed to adult learning principles and instructional design, um, and had kind of figured out that that was the career I wanted to pursue uh, from a human resources perspective. And so um, I ended up at RIT, and I took the program there. Um, it was a two-year program, and um, online and in-person. And believe it or not, back in the 90s at the birth of the internet. And so that was uh, pretty cutting edge stuff at the time. It was good. And then I, um, I had worked at a company called Dun & Bradstreet while I was in that program. And then I left Dun & Bradstreet and went to Coopers & Librand, um, which is now PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, spent a little bit of time, honestly, like 15 months there. But I met my wife and um, that, pre that precipitated my moving to somewhere else. And so we moved uh, to Atlanta and I worked for Bell South in their wireless business where I worked on management and leadership development programs. Um, in 2000, Bell South spun its wireless business off into Singular Wireless, which some of you may remember in the early 2000s. Um, and I, that was my first real experience uh, leading a learning and development organization where I was tasked really with building the L&D function from the ground up. 
um, figuring out the strategy structure um, and you know and how we prioritize what we need to go after as a, as a function. Um, I did that for about six years and uh, through some mergers and acquisitions and other lots of great experiences that I got there. Uh, from there, I wanted to get some global experience. So I started looking around in the marketplace and um, I wound up at Yum Brands, which is uh, probably mostly unknown, but it's KFC Pizza and Taco Bell's parent company. And, um, and that got me into my first kind of global role where I really had a similar type responsibility enterprise-wide uh, for the global learning strategy for all three brands. Um, and it really took me around the world to pretty much um, see learning in action and understand learning in different cultures and uh, understand learning in different pieces um, and really how we can build leadership capability around, around the world on that. Um, in 2014, McDonald's actually approached me and um, that's how I uh, ended up at McDonald's as well. And McDonald's um, was similar sort of scope in terms of work effort at, at McDonald's. Um, but McDonald's was the first actually global chief learning officer um, that they ever had in its history. Um, and the idea was to really bring together uh, and uh, accelerate the maturity of the learning function of the business and to be more impactful on the business, um, to be a bit less redundant because it had been very All right, I think we might have lost Rob for a minute there. Let's see if we can get him reconnected. Yes. Well, he's coming on, I think. Oh, maybe he's logging out and logging in again. Right. All right, well, we wait for Rob. Malar, Jared, why don't you, um, could you just give us a quick uh, overview of, of your respective program, just so we can, you know, cover that now. I know we're going to go into that a little later, but um, while Rob's logging back on, if you can just give a quick snapshot of that for us. Yes, Jerry, do you want to start? Yeah, you want, Jerry, I think you can start, then I will. Oh, okay. And then, you know, uh, I just want to share with everyone that this year, you know, RIT actually launched a new online uh, master in hospitality and business management program. And then this online program actually is designed with the industry trends in mind. So, you know, this program actually, you know, in addition to uh, hospitality focus, this program also focus on technology data analytics, and then, you know, also the, you know, hotel real estate and hotel investment. So whoever would like to develop a career related to, you know, especially in a hotel investment, hotel real estate, or, you know, more in the marketing uh, analytics, data analytics, this will be a great program, you know, to help you to advance your future career. Yes, thank you, Jerry. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, Yes, I'm Malar Hirdey Raj. I'm the uh, program director for the MS in Organizational Leadership and Innovation Program, which also is being launched this fall. MS Organization Leadership and Innovation is a kind of um, um, program which is meant specifically for people who are interested in leading innovation initiatives and projects within organizations and people who want to know how to lead innovative minds, right? Uh, because innovation is different from creativity. So you have to think about the entire process of converting an idea into a product. So the uh, organization leadership and innovation degree gives you kind of the knowledge and skills you need to, uh, to lead innovation processes, innovation technology, and also innovation in terms of people. So it's a very, um, yeah, interesting degree and very, uh, very much sought after by the industry because the skills that we teach on this program are based on what industries are looking for yeah, in, in the current day and age, wherever you are in the world. So 
this would be an interesting um, uh, program for people who are interested in innovation, whether you work in innovation industries or you work in traditional industries who want to uh, introduce innovative projects, this might be a good place to learn how to do that. All right, Rob, welcome back. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> for some reason my internet quit. So I actually heard Matt say we lost Rob and I'm still talking and I can see myself, <laughs> but, but nothing's happening apparently. So. Uh, <laughs> You know, so it was a great dialogue. I'm sorry you all missed it, but um, no, I apologize again. I don't, I'm not sure what happened. My internet quit, so I had to reboot everything. So here we are. Um, so anyway, I was, uh, I'm was i not sure where I left off, but I'll pick up from McDonald's. Um, McDonald's, my experience there was really about um, galvanizing the global leadership uh, and, and galvanizing sort of the decentralized McDonald's organization around a singular learning strategy for the business. Um, and really thinking about how we advance it and how we move it uh, into the future. Uh, and that included basically this model for how it's funded and how it's structured and how it's organized, the infrastructure. So what learning technology tools do we use? How do we deliver uh, programs and where do we deliver programs? And then content, of course, uh, which is always uh, important and ever changing in today's environment. That's excellent. Uh, Rob, I actually have another question about your career story, okay? So how did you keep your passion for your career across decades? Maybe you can share with us. Yeah, you know, I, I always looked at, um, I always thought about my career as like a series of challenges and a, a series of, um, of, of journeys, I guess it was. You know, so like, it, it, I can remember in each role that I went into probably, you know, even even I'd say after my RI, after I graduated from RIT, I started thinking a little bit differently about my careers. And I started thinking about it more along the lines of, um, can I see myself being challenged? And for how long can I see myself being challenged in a particular role? So, um, so you know, I think about my singular wireless experience. It was extremely challenging. It was doing things I had never done before. Um, it was challenges in the context of the wireless business that had never been done before, um, those kind of things. So I, I, I thought about my career in the context of um, and the choices that I made about how challenging they would be to me personally, um, one, and then two, how much impact I thought I could bring to the organization itself. Uh, regardless of um, you know innovation, you were just talking about it's a relative thing, right? So um, you know innovation at McDonald's was bringing everybody into an e-learning infrastructure in 2015, right? Well, you know e-learning is a 25-year-old idea at that point, so it's not really innovative in the big context, but it was innovative in the McDonald's context. So thinking about um, you know how much of an impact can I have in the organization? Those have sort of been the two sort of North stars that I used in thinking about my career. Um, yeah, I also thought about, you know, um, you know, honestly, and I think everybody thinks about this is um, how will this role help me into my next role, or where do I go from here? Maybe a, a simpler question, right? Um, when I stepped into any role that I had, so the, you know, so even in preceding my. Um, you know, I was in an operations role when I first got out of undergrad and um, I moved into being a stand-up trainer. And the big question was like, okay, so where is this going to take me? And I didn't really know at the time, but it was sort of a nagging question for me. And that led me into sort of instructional design and, um, you know, learning design, adult learning principles, which then got me um, super passionate about wanting to go to RIT, for example, to get my, uh, my master's. And I think that that... Um, you know, all of those things were in mind with like, how is that going to help me move forward in my career? How's that going to set me up for the next thing, even though I didn't know what it was? Um, and how how can I see the actions that I take help create a future for me uh, for some, you know, indefinable time, uh, but recognizing that forever at the same time? Thank you, Rob. It's, it's, it's inspiring. So now Dr. Mala will continue the conversation on leadership. Great. Thank you, Jerry. <clears throat> Rob, with your background, in, you seem to be an individual who's always uh, you know, very much aware of the trends that are coming up in the industry. You seem to have kept up and you know, evolved in your role with, it, um, with the role of the trends. And you also have seem to have had a long career in leadership. So that mm -hmm. 
kind of brings me to my first question. What major trends in leadership do you see emerging in the next few years? Yeah, I, th I think looking backwards, right, in the last couple of years, there's been some pretty significant turbulence, I guess, uh, you know, in the leadership airplane um, as it's been flying along. I think there's a few um, that I would think about. Uh, I think the emphasis around um, leadership around diversity and inclusion and belonging and uh, leadership itself, <laughs> um, diversity, inclusion and belonging uh, are probably gonna continue to be super important trends um, that are emerging. I think the, the past has been largely programmatically driven, but I think the shift that you're seeing from a trend perspective is gonna be more, it's gonna become a leadership expectation uh, of every leader that you're really focused on those three things. Uh, you know, you've got diversity of background, thinking, thought, experience, you know, whatever attributes you wanna put against it. Um, you, you want an inclusive environment where people have the opportunity to be heard um, and feel like they're part of something. Um, and then that belonging piece where um, as a leader, you're responsible really to make sure that people feel like they belong there. Right, um, and that they're welcome there. I, I think is are, are, is one trend. I think another one's around digital leadership. I would say, mm -hmm. um, and so you know, digital transformation has been a big word the last few years, and particularly since COVID. I think um, where you know I call it forced innovation. Right, when you can't meet people face to face, um, you know, it forces a lot of innovation, and so um, the constraints uh, drove a lot of new thinking. But I think digital leadership is is emerging really as as important. Meaning, um, you know, what does that mean? It means two things. I think that you have an understanding of how to leverage digital tools, um, and there's many that are coming out. And uh, I think, frankly, a lot of people played catch up in the last few years on what was available and how to use those. Um, and I think the trend now is like, so, um, how does my leadership style change? when I'm dealing with remote work or I'm dealing with hybrid work or, um, you know, um, or I'm literally dealing with someone that I hired two years ago that I've never actually met in person, right? Mm -hmm. And how do I be an effective leader and a connected leader to that person? And that, so I think that aspect of digital leader is gonna be really important. Mm -hmm. um, one that I'm seeing emerging now is one around empathy. So empathetic kind of leadership, mm -hmm. I guess I would call it. Mm -hmm. It's really around leaning into, again, not new concepts, but really um, changing the dimensions around the thought around things like emotional intelligence. Um, and, and I think the well-being conversation that's going on very loudly mm -hmm. right now in organizations is shifting to sit there and say, uh, as leaders, you have to be much more empathetic to the whole person, not just mm -hmm. the person that shows up at work. Uh, and recognizing that there could be a lot of things going on with that individual outside of work. Um, and as an empathetic leader, you would get, you'd be able to one, draw that out of people so that they would be feel comfortable talking to you about that. And that two, you would be um, again, you know, sort of inclusive and that belonging component where you're able to uh, help them work through it in a way that helps them be productive and more connected to the business and getting things done. So I think that that you know showing you care is sort of the you know is, is really simplified, but I really think that that that's going to be an important trend as we go. Um, you know, purpose-driven leadership is another one that sort of crosses my mind as well, and that's been that's not really a new idea. I mean, I think the servant leader books like super old, mm -hmm. but um, this notion around purpose has been emerging and and growing as we go. But I do think that that's going to be. Um, another trend that people are going to lean into around mm -hmm. two dimensions, I think, is one around um, like understanding your purpose as an individual, like so literally, you know, fundamental questions about why are you here and what is it you're trying to do, um, uh, and then taking it a little bit higher to a more macro level around the organization itself, uh, mm -hmm. and what's the purpose-driven organization um, you know, how do I connect as a leader into the purpose-driven organization, and how do I make sure that the, you know, the organization is aligned around a purpose that the people that work in it really care about? I think that that will be important. And then, you know, I, I think the last one that comes into my mind is like uh, disruptions only around the corner. Uh, you know, um, you know, we can go back in history and see lots of opportunities for disruption where, you know, where leaders have really been thrown off their game, either from uh, innovation 
you know, like today's conversation around chat GPT mm -hmm. uh, and how that's disrupting the world to, um, you know, to things like COVID that are really disrupting as well. So, you know, the, the, the agile leader, the, the leader that's able to um, roll with disruption and interruption and changes uh, um, is going to be a super, super important trend because, well, I think it's, you know, it's certainly calmed down from the uncertainty of COVID. I don't think that um, you know disruption is going to change anytime soon. Interesting, interesting. You say that these are the kind of things that we talk about in the program all along. Uh, that brings me to my next question on uh, the skills leaders need in 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 the future, right? Specifically, when you talk about uh, uh, leading with with empathy, you know, being a you know purpose driven leader and leading, um, you know, in, in the middle of disruption and change, right? How, how, what kind of skills do leaders need in these, uh, in these work contexts? And how are these different from traditional leadership skills and attributes that we have been talking about for, for generations now? Yeah, I think, it, um, yeah, you know, I don't have, I don't have thoughts in particular order, but I would say like, um, the emphasis on soft skills, for example, although mm -hmm. soft, other people call them power skills or mm -hmm. whatever you want to call them, right? Um, you know, people skills, right? Mm -hmm. um, are probably um, different than what, you know, the emphasis on them is definitely different going forward than it has been in the past, uh, mm -hmm. tied to that sort of empathetic leadership component piece. Mm -hmm. So your ability to be really effective at that um, I think is a skill that's going to be necessary to be successful as a leader, um, you know, because it comes down to that fundamental thing of do people want to follow you? And I think that that, that's, that, that piece, uh, those soft skill components, your ability to communicate, your ability to create an environment where people can be motivated, um, your ability to connect on a personal level with the people that work for you, uh, mm -hmm. your ability to frankly, um, not be afraid of conflict and know how to navigate it and how to engage in you know, constructive feedback and dialogue, those kind of things, um, mm -hmm. I think are super important expectations that are gonna be placed on leaders going forward. Uh, whereas in the past, um, I would say that they, you know, I'd argue they were negotiable. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that the trend is now that uh, those skills are really moving towards non-negotiable. Absolutely. Right? Uh, I, I think about that. And, and some of the other ones I think um, that jump out at, at me are like, um, you know, in the, in the past 15 years, like globalization's really become a, um, like much more of a reality in terms of, mm. you know, connectedness, I guess it would mm. be, right? Geography is still geography. <laughs> you know, China's still 12,000 miles from here or whatever it is. But, I th but the, the reality of being um, connected real time with somebody, you know, thousands of miles away um, makes a difference as well. And it's not uncommon, like at McDonald's, I had teams that were everywhere, you know, on every continent, just about, except Antarctica. But, um, you know, your ability to connect with them and connect with them culturally also mm -hmm. really you know, um, matters a lot. Um, and, and I think that, 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 um, that global perspective and being able to work with people from different cultures and uh, in different places across different times mm -hmm. um, matters a lot. And I think I think that'll be uh, you know that'll be an important skill that people should be thinking about uh, because it won't be uncommon that you're on a team with somebody you know from another you know in another country um, mm -hmm. you know in a different time zone uh, working at you know in, with a completely different life experience than you mm -hmm. from what you can see beyond the screen. And I think that that will matter a lot from a leadership perspective. And then the last one I'd say is around, um, around um, I, I guess, sort of organizational structures. Um, hmm. there's, there's been a trend towards more flat, you know, flatter organizations, I think, over the last 15 or 20 years. And, um, you know, and this notion of sort of working in a matrix Mm -hmm. I think is, is really emerging as something that um, is going to be an important skill to be able to navigate. And, and that will lean then into people's ability to influence mm -hmm. and be persuasive. Um, your ability to build relationships and create connections, basically, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I think that piece is super important as well. Um, mm -hmm. that, that 
if, if, you know, if I was starting over in my career, I'd be thinking about like, how am I tending to or building my capabilities in those areas mm -hmm. um, as a way to sort of move forward and be most effective? Wonderful. It, you, you bring some exciting points, right? So in terms of uh, the diversity in, uh, in, in the people that you work with, right? So being able to deal uh, uh, lead a team of people across the globe. And uh, I'm, I'm interested in understanding your thoughts or suggestions on leading a multi-generational team that has become very, very critical these days as well, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when you're leading innovation and you're leading in very, uh, you know, cutting edge uh, uh, work context. So what suggestions do you have for leaders who lead a multi-generational uh, workforce or teams? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because there's been so much written about it and, and so mm -hmm. much talked about. And um, I, I'm a big fundamental believer that it's really about just meeting people where they are, mm -hmm. right? And, um, you know, and, and for example, um, you know, there's so much talk about the, you know, um, the millennials or whatever, pick, you know, pick whichever generation we're talking about today, the newest generation into the workforce. And, um, but the reality of it is, you know, um, they're as ambitious as I was when I was 20 years old, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a, I actually think it's more a life stage thing than, than it is more the sort of a what generational bucket we want to put people mm -hmm. in. And so when you think about multi-generational, uh, you know, workforces and teams and, as a leader, you have to recognize that people are at different places mm -hmm. and uh, different people value different things, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, so, uh, um, you know, uh, a young mom or a young family, uh, you know, a person with a young family is going to have different needs than uh, someone like me, who's my kids are all off and gone. Mm -hmm. uh, or if I, you know, and it'll be different than somebody who's right out of college. So mm -hmm. I think about like, um, you know, I think about things about uh, like inclusion, which we talked a little bit about. And how do I make all those people feel like they belong? Mm -hmm. I think is super important. Um, and, and, and again, you know, connecting on a personal level to understand where everyone's at is a super important piece as well. Um, I think the other one that's really interesting is, you know, from my background is about thinking about providing opportunities for learning and growth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there can be um, stereotypes pretty easily applied, like to people my age that are, you know, sort of you know, moving out of the workforce, right? Oh, they don't want to learn anymore. Or you can't teach an old dog do tricks, the old sayings. I think it's fundamentally untrue in the workplace and mm -hmm. um, that, that people are looking for it. And mm -hmm. so multi-generational pieces, for example, you know, we talked about digital literacy, mm -hmm. um, you know, super opportunity for, you know, what some might call reverse mentoring, which is mm -hmm. younger people mentoring older people on, mm -hmm. you know, how technology works or how to digitally connect with people or how to even communicate um, in a digital world. I think those kind of things are, are great opportunities that a multi-generational workforce present um, mm -hmm. for learning and for growth um, that, that leaders can take advantage of. Um, I think, um, you know, and then that's tied to like collaboration and mentorship, I think are like super, mm -hmm. uh, become actually easier to execute in that kind of environment where you do have multi-generational workforce. Um, and then I think, you know, I think a few things that need to be considered are like, there is generational bias, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about mm -hmm. that in terms of millennials or older um, mm -hmm. ageism or whatever it might be. And, and then um, recognizing the, and valuing experiences that people bring to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's regardless of where you are from an age perspective. Um, but, you know, my 30 years in L&D, okay, I bring a unique perspective to it. But my experiences aren't the same as, you know, Matt's or, or you know, or yours or Jerry's. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, recognizing that we're, we're all equals in, in the context of experiences that we've had, we're all unique, I should say, in the experiences that we've had, and we can all make uh, great contributions with those experiences to solve any particular problem mm -hmm. is, um, is the way I would suggest that leaders think about working with their workforce when they, when they do. And it can be hard, especially if you're, you know, 35 years old and, you know, four people of the seven people on your team are, you know, 10 years older than you, right? Um, your your uh, generational bias can be can be difficult because you you might have your own insecurities about your experience level against mm -hmm. those those people that have been around much longer in that workplace. 
Um, yeah. So I, I think, you know, I think it's important to recognize that and mm -hmm. lean into that. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, managers that are um, especially transparent about that uh, will do really well. Mm -hmm. Interesting, because when I teach my undergrad students, I always remind them. So when they walk into the workplace, uh, their their co-workers are going to look more like their dads and uncles and aunts and, you know, uh, moms. Uh, sometimes even people that you have run away from, right? So, but you have to deal with them on a daily basis, right? So that's right. It works both ways. So you need they need to learn to communicate with each other and you know uh, develop relationships and trust. That that's so you so you make some excellent points there about uh, leveraging the, um, the the advantages, the benefits of having a multi generational workforce and and uh, building productive relationships. That also brings me to, to, to wonder about the challenges leaders face today and maybe in the future. What uh, new challenges do you think leaders of today and tomorrow might encounter? Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, I've touched on some of these, but I think that, um, you know, like managing change mm -hmm. is, not a, is not a new idea. But I do mm -hmm. think that, that um, people are facing it today probably more than ever. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's there's change on so many fronts in terms of like adapt, adapting to technological changes or, mm -hmm. um, you know, or <laughs> environmental changes or social change, right? Environmental changes, um, those kind of things. I think um, being able to um, sort of roll with it, I was talking er on an earlier call today with somebody about their locus of control, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, when COVID hit, um, you know, teams inside organizations were like, okay, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. And, and you know, the, the, the biggest hurdle I faced, for example, at McDonald's was getting people to realize, like, let's talk about the things we can't change that are, that are being sort of done to us. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then put those aside. And now let's talk about how we work within the structure of the change that's being put upon us. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, so I think that that ability to manage change is not going to go away. You know, mm -hmm. today, you, if you talk to managers, you'll hear conversations about like, you know, I have people that come in the office three days a week and that everybody comes in the same three days. And, mm -hmm. you know, I go to have a team meeting and some are at home and some are not or some are in, you know, other other parts of the country or whatever it might be. Um, and that's a new challenge for me. And I have to figure out how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Right. Two years from now, it'll probably be something else. Yes. Um, and, 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 you know, five years from now, I'm sure there'll be something else that, that makes it even more tricky. You think about things like artificial intelligence and machine learning as they start creeping into the workplace, um, they'll be disruptive as well, too, and mm -hmm. change the way people have to operate. So I think that managing change piece can't be underestimated mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, needing to be able to, you know, people will be facing that. I think the second one is around, um, you know, uh, building and managing teams. So, mm -hmm. um, so in that context, how do you build teams that are really change resilient um, mm -hmm. and agile, basically able to pivot? So, mm -hmm. you know, how do you seek out people that, that are um, able to learn, basically, mm -hmm. I would say, mm -hmm. um, you know, because as new variables get introduced to your environment, new decisions need to be made. Um, and sticking, you know, uh, these days, probably more than ever, sticking with the way things always have been is like the fastest path to failure, I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, so building an effective team that can really work with you on that is going to be super important. And, and then I think the last ones uh, might be around, um, you know, the challenge would be around, you know, the balance of short term and long term. Mm. Right. And, in, in you mm -hmm. know, um, in many public companies and in many startups, right, short term matters a lot. Um, and, and, you know, um, the old notion of sort of clock building, right, good mm -hmm. to great um, kind of ideas um, is, is still super important. Mm -hmm. But navigating and be, you'll be challenged as a leader and continue to be challenged as a leader on delivering short term results, yet at the same time, uh, working against a long term strategy that you're going to have. And I can remember at McDonald's, you know, some of the things that are even young brands, some of the things I worked on took five, six, seven years to actually come to fruition. And it was the same mm -hmm. bullet point year after year on what the strategy was, right? Mm -hmm. The tactics kept evolving over time, but the strategy mm -hmm. remained the same. So I think being able to sort of, um, you know, balance what I needed to do in the short term against what has to happen in the long term, that'll continue to be a challenge for people. 
Yeah, this is one of the key concepts that I teach in the leading innovation course, right? So being able to handle the present, the, the, uh, the, the keep the business running, right? So as well as start thinking about and working for the future today, the future is not tomorrow, it is today. So you have to spend time and energy and resources on building for your future while you're also focused on, you know, keeping the, 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 the cash flow and, and the process is going currently, right? So no, the, the, world, the world does not stop for you to kind of prepare for the future. You have to do it simultaneously and that's, that becomes another challenge. Yes, you don't get much time for it. So yeah. it's usually right on. Usually, usually it's on you before you even recognize it. So yes. yeah. Yeah. And uh, um, finally, before I hand over to Jerry, I wanted to ask you about some specific issues that uh, managers of today seem to be facing, especially after COVID and all the disruption that, that's been around for uh, the last couple of years. Uh, for instance, in terms of quiet quitting. Yeah. Right. So how do you, what, as a leader, what would your suggestions be for a leader to be actively engaged with the employees? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting phenomenon, right? I think 4 million people still quit their jobs in December. Mm -hmm. So it's it's been a trend for, I don't know, probably 15 to 18 months. I mean, it's been mm -hmm. amazing how long that that and staggering that number is. And maybe we just didn't measure it before. I don't even know what it was before, but it feels like a big number every month now. And so um, you know, that's maybe some of the problem with data, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't know you had a problem before. Yeah. Now suddenly you're like, holy cow, what's going on here? And we should put a label on it, quiet quitting. I, I actually think it's, um, you know, it's an interesting phenomenon, but I, I, I really think it's, um, it's important that as a leader, you sit there and sort of identify and address what the underlying issues might be. Mm -hmm. Like probably identifying the underlying issue is probably the biggest challenge up front, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think a lot of organizations are quick to try to address the issue without mm -hmm. actually identifying what the underlying issue is. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and I'll use a simple example like wages, right? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, they think they're losing people over pay when, um, you know, the old saying, you can't pay me enough to do this job didn't come mm -hmm. from nowhere, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are other things at play for people right now. Um, and, I, and I talk about it in the context of sort of three different things and that's around fit. Like, do I feel like I belong here? Does this company make me feel like I belong? Um, flexibility. So, you know, does am I able to work around my my needs, right? Mm -hmm. Whether I'm, you know, whether I'm working in a McDonald's and I can work the days and shifts that I want, or mm -hmm. whether I'm working in an office and uh, you know I have kids mm -hmm. or whatever and I need to work from home a couple of days a week, right? Do I have that kind of flexibility? And then the last one's really around future. And is the company that I'm working in, do I see if do I see it creating a future for me, either at that company or somewhere else even? Right. Um, but, am, you know, is, is the place I'm at helping me advance somewhere, even within that company? And I think when you get to that, people value those three things differently. To some people, flexibility is way more important, maybe than fit or future, um, those kind of things. But if you're not uh, paying attention to the individuals and how you're addressing each of those three things, that's, I think, where quiet quitting comes into play. That's my hypothesis. Think I'm kind of right on it from everybody I've talked to about it, but um, you know I, I think that that is um, that that like leaders should be thinking about those three things when dealing with people. It's mm -hmm. fit, flexibility, and future. And have and are they launching? You know, are they addressing those things with them? Interesting. I like the three Fs: fit, um, um, flexibility, like, and future. I'll remember that in my classes. So yeah. um, I, I hand over to Jerry to continue the conversation with you. Thank sure. you. Thank you for your time, Rob. No, thank you. Yeah, Rob, uh, thank you for sharing your wisdom and insight with us today. And somebody said that leadership is a journey. So what my final question for you is that what advice would you offer, you know, to our audience to prepare themselves to become a good leader for the future? Yeah, I think good leader is like a, a, you know, the word good is a, I'll, I'll start with saying like, that's an endless pursuit, right? Because I, I think like, you know, I've had some pretty big leadership roles and I've always been trying to get better 
at what I can be as a leader. I always, you know, I can tell you five ways I could have been better as a leader, right? Those kind of things. So I think one, recognizing that it's a pursuit uh, and an aspiration and the, um, the pursuit of it's very important uh, that you continue to do that and you keep the mindset open um, that, I'm, um, that I'm a good leader, but I, I can be better, right? Because I think that that level of humility then keeps you pursuing the opportunity to become even better as a leader as one. So I think that like that leadership mindset piece is really important. Um, I think too, I would say um, everybody, regardless of like, if you think of the traditional organizational hierarchy, everyone has an opportunity to lead. So, um, you know, my assistant that, that, you know, handled my life basically at McDonald's um, had a huge opportunities to lead, even though she didn't have a team working for her. Right, she would lead me in some cases, or she would, you know, she would help get things done through others as well. So I think don't en don't underestimate the um, opportunity to lead before you're necessarily given sort of the hierarchical responsibility to lead either. Um, you can start doing that now and building your capabilities now in terms of your ability to lead, and um, you know. I, and I think that, that that it's really important that people sort of work on that and think about that. Um, I think looking for, you know, there, there are tons of opportunity, like even to your students to become leaders right now as well. Um, there's no shortage in any community um, where volunteers aren't needed at not-for-profits, at, you know, other charities, those kind of things in your community where someone will be would welcome you to step up and take the lead on something for them. And it's a great place and a great way to get practical experience um, and to honestly help you deal with some of the challenges. Um, and actually, you know, uh, leading without authority in, in those constructs is even more complicated. So it's a great sort of proving ground, low risk, no risk proving ground for you to really hone your skill, get better at, uh, make some mistakes, honestly. Um, and, and prepare yourself for much bigger opportunities. Another thing I'd say then is around um, like building a professional network. So um, I think connecting to people that are leaders in the organization, not necessarily like the senior leaders in the organization, but people that are leaders in the organization and how do you develop relationships with them where you can learn from their experiences as well um, and, and listen to and hear from um, their shortcomings, their mistakes, their opportunities are super great ways for you to be able to build your leadership capability. And then the, the last thing I think, um, and it served me well through most of my career, is like uh, consistently seeking out feedback. Right. So uh, I would always ask people on my team, how am I doing <laughs> as your leader? Right. And sometimes I didn't want to hear the answer, but um, or I didn't like the answer. But um, but at the same time, you know, you, you will you can't change if you don't get the feedback, if some if people don't tell you. And one of the problems of being like, particularly as you move up to more senior leadership roles, is people won't give you the feedback. And so finding uh, and seeking out that feedback is really important. Um, and um, and demonstrating that you want the feedback because you want to improve. Uh, back to that mindset piece. I think is a super important thing that people can start doing right now and carry with you through your life as a leader. Uh, thank you, Rob. Thank you so much. For thank you, Jerry. Advice. Sure. Thank you. thank you. Those are wonderful insights from your experience and, and from the field, uh, Rob, about leading into the future, right? You've, you've brought some interesting points about skills leaders need to engage with a diverse workforce and actively engaging with your workforce in terms of ensuring fit, flexibility, and, and the future. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us and uh, talk to us about leadership. Thanks no, so much. To. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank now I so hand much. over to Matt to field questions from the audience. Yeah, so we did have a couple of questions come in. I, I took care of those. They were just brief ones, kind of follow up. But if we do have questions from anybody in the audience, feel free to throw those into the Q&A um, and we can certainly address those at this point. Yeah, ask me anything is what I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, here we go. Okay, so this is, this is a good question, Rob. So um, can we discuss more about the benefits of a flat organization and why is why is it more beneficial? Or maybe not from, from your viewpoint. Well, I, I, think it, I think it can cut both ways. So depending on your perspective and what's important to you. So I think flatter organizations are advantageous to people um, because the um, constraints of hierarchy aren't necessarily there. So what do I mean by that? Meaning in a flatter organization, people tend to be able to work across functions easier um, and, and get you can get more diversity of experience in a flatter organization than you can in a more rigid hierarchical organization. In hierarchical organizations, you tend to be more sort of pigeonholed into a set of tasks and a role. And that's what your job is really about. Where in a flatter organization, um, influence is what really matters. And if you're, if you're able to influence, um, it doesn't really matter what your sort of the box of your role is because you're typically able to work beyond the box of your role uh, across functionally and across teams and across an organization um, in a way where you can navigate your own way to success and influence. So um, it's interesting because um, you know there's a guy Jay Cross that he's at Babson that I that I know pretty well and he does work around social network analysis inside organizations, and uh, he particularly looks at matrix organizations and finds um, you'll find some really amazing um, results when looking at like social network analysis inside an organization of who the most influential people in the business really are, and they're not ones on that's not looking it doesn't look like the org chart. <laughs> it's people that know how to navigate across the business, who know how to influence, who know how to build relationships and know how to make connections. They get invited to the most opportunities. They get involved in the most experiences. They find themselves in the middle of like critical business activities and initiatives. Um, and they, I'd say that on a personal level, they feel like their sense of impact is much greater than it would if they were sitting in a traditional hierarchical organization. And there's probably, you all would know better than me from an academic perspective, there's probably lots of data that supports that kind of thinking. But that's been my sort of personal observation on it um, in, in the, um, you know, in sort of my years of work. Like at McDonald's, I, I largely try to avoid ever publishing an org chart because it's like we all have a job to do. Right, Mine's, my job was to get stuff out of people's way so they could get things done and to set direction to sort of say, this is where we wanted to go. Um, but, you know, it didn't, I didn't care um, where great ideas could come from. They didn't have to come up in org chain, right? They could come from, you know, um, a, a, in a, you know, a training coordinator in Australia might have a brilliant idea that can solve a lot of problems at McDonald's. Why should I devalue them? Because they sit in a particular box in a particular org in a particular structure in the business. Um, and so focusing on that, I think really helps that again, around that culture of inclusion, I think flatter organizations drive more inclusive behaviors. They're more difficult for individuals to navigate if you, um, if you wanna be told what to do though. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you, Rob, that, that's great. Thank sure. You. So we got a bunch of more, a bunch more questions. So we got some good Great. ones here. Um, if you had one do over, what would it be? Oh gosh, <laughs> the list is probably pretty long. Um, one do over. I think, you know, um, I'll relate it to um, sort of a miscalculation I made when I, when I came to work at Yum Brands, one of the tasks I had was to align the um, organization. Uh, it, well, it wasn't even that. It was to implement a uh, global learning technology platform in the business so that we were all sort of using the same learning management system uh, to access training around the world at, at KFC, Pizza, and Taco Bell. And that was kind of the charge that I was given by the CEO. And so I came into the business from outside of the business, and I'm like, okay, that's the charge then all right, I'm going to gather some information. I'm going to make the decision and off we're going to go. And um, I quickly ran into the um, woodshed or chainsaw of resistance in the organization because um, decision-making rights had traditionally sat elsewhere in the organization on those kind of things. 
And so my um, my ignorance, I guess, you know, being brutal on myself here, but my ignorance of sort of organizational history and political dynamics in the organization uh, caused me to miscalculate, I would say, how easy it would be to move a decision forward and, and just go and get it done. Because in the preceding organization I was in, that's pretty much how it worked. Like it was clear, like it's your decision, go, right? And you know, and you face all the consequences, by the way, uh, for what works and what doesn't, which was fair. But in this organization, it was more about um, taking people with you, I guess would be the best way to describe it. And there's a book on it actually from the CEO, David Novak, uh, called Taking People With You. And I think I underestimated that pretty significantly early um, and stumbled a bit in my role um, and my ability to get things done. I eventually did get it done, but what happened was I probably, I was probably set back for like literally a year um, because my initial approach wasn't the way that the organization kind of accepted how decisions got made. And so, um, so I had made a decision, I pushed it forward, I'd started down a path and everybody's like, whoa, wait a second, right? And so that, whoa, wait a second, meant I had to sort of start all over from the beginning. And even though I knew what the right answer was, right, in my mind, I had to convince a lot of other people that, that the answer I knew was right was right for them. And I think I underestimated that. And if I was gonna do it all over again, I would have started there. That's awesome. Just for your information, Rob, the do over question is from your friend Kimo. Oh, Kimo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, Kimo. He's not supposed to be on here. So <laughs> Aloha, Kimo. So and mahalo for the question. All right, good. What else? <laughs> Um, so my one of my colleagues here in, in Saunders, Peggy, she was just wondering what year you graduated from from RIT. Oh, 1995. Okay, Peggy was 95 too. H, uh, human resource development program. Chemo was 94. Okay, so. very nice. And then um, John asks, what was the best feedback you received from one of your employees or, or multiple employees? The best feedback. I think usually the best feedback I got from people was like just a simple thank you. Like, I mean, you know, you know, as opposed to like tailoring it down to a specific incident, I think I got great satisfaction when somebody else felt like I helped solve a problem for them, right? And that um, that I helped them be successful in some way, right? So, um, like, you know, even letting people go, which is like the privilege, I used to joke, it's the privilege of leadership to lay people off, right? Because um, it's the most horrendous experience that you ever want to have, because you know, you're directly impacting people personally, and it's not fun. And so, um, but, um, but I've had conversations with people that were like, like not fitting in the organization, you know, on fit, flexibility, future, talk about fit. Um, they were here, they didn't really feel like they belonged. They were quietly quitting on me. Their performance was showing. And instead of doing a traditional thing of taking people down a performance management route and involving HR and those kind of things, um, typically I, I, I used to call it my fork in the road conversation where I'd sit there and say like, we're at this point where here's, what's, here's what I see happening. You know, so here's what as a leader I'm, I'm going to have to do next. Right. Um, so before we even get to that point, let's talk about what's going on. Let's talk about your feelings about where you're working right now. And let's figure out a path that works for everybody. And on the four or five times I had that conversation, people quit instead of me having to fire them. And but they were able to do it on their terms, because typically what I my typical sort of formula was, Okay, so let's agree in 90 days then that you're gonna exit the organization and you're gonna spend the next 90 days trying to find your next role. And I'm happy to help you. And you should go somewhere where you're gonna be happy because you're not happy here, right? So take the time, find the place that's gonna make you happy and go. Because my attitude as a leader was, if you're not happy in the role, I'm getting like 50% of your capability out of you, 
right? I'm getting 50% of your energy when I need like 120% of your energy to get things done because we're, sh we're always short resources. There's never enough people to do everything that needs to be done, probably in any function anywhere. So, you know, so my attitude was like, if you're not into it, it's okay. I'm not taking it personally, but let's be honest about it and let's find some place for you to go. Um, and the, the most of, I would say, in every case that I had that conversation, the person came back and thanked me, especially after they landed their next job and they were off the moon happy and really excited about what they were doing, regardless of what they were doing. Um, people were back and were like, thank you, because I needed to be kicked in the butt and moved on, or uh, you know, I was quietly quitting and you, know, you found me out, but you, know, you did me the favor that needed to be done, those kind of things. So I think I, I took a lot of satisfaction out of those situations as well, because I, you know, feedback from those situations as well, because in a, in a more traditional way, it gets very contentious and it never ends well. And you, you almost burn the bridge of relationship on that. And a few of those people I'm still friends with and talk to today. One of them actually, I just gave career advice to last week. So it's, you know, I, I think like, that sort of very complimentary for me in terms of um, feedback from people, right? Just treating them with humanity. Awesome, thank you, Rob, appreciate that. And then one last question here, if there is one quality that all leaders need, what would you say this is? Um, well, there's a lot, so it's hard to say one, but I think that the, the one that matters the most is, um, probably self like self-awareness right but I like I know what I'm good at I know what I'm not good at I know where my shortcomings are um, you know and I know the environment where I can excel and I know the environment where I'm going to fail so um, because those things get in the way of being an effective leader if you're not aware of those things right? You know, I've always wanted to lead people. I always wanted to lead people, but you have no idea, you know, if you if that's like your ambition and you're blind to your own shortcomings and your own strengths, um, I, I think you wind up in some pretty tough predicaments sometimes. So I'd say like foundationally, self-awareness is super important and some humility in that, you know, is included as well. Great, thank you, Rob, appreciate that. Sure. All right, so that that wraps up the questions as well. Malar and Jerry, anything else you want to add before we close? Yeah, I would say a, I mean, a, a great round of applause for Rob and thank you for all the uh, wonderful insights and the experiences that you shared. You know, it's really insightful uh, to see it from from that perspective. I wouldn't have imagined uh, that that would have been a very satisfying um, moment for you in terms of helping people, you know, create their own uh, paths. Thank you very much for being here and taking the time. No, Thank really you. great to be here and uh, happy to see uh, alum and alma mater anytime. And uh, thanks for having me here. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thanks again, Rob. Appreciate it. And thank right. you, everybody, thank you. for joining us. We appreciate your time. And um, we'll certainly be in touch with the recording if, if you want to view, view later on.